Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Something to Sasquatch About. Today's guest is a field investigator with the BFRO. He's a fisherman, a hunter. He loves the outdoors. He's been on expeditions and he's led expeditions. Welcome to the show, Kevin Llewellyn. Hello, Kevin. Thank you for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me, Sean. Yeah, it's been a great year, another great year um, with everything involved with big footing and, and camping. Uh, had a first thing that I've, or a first thing that happened to me that I've never had happen before uh, this earlier this summer that my audio recorder picked up a cat meowing. So that was a bobcat and uh, there were bobcat tracks in the area. But, you know, that's kind of amazing when I'm reviewing my audio and all of a sudden there's, you know, meow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My buddy just posted something about that. I think he got something too. And he goes, yeah. or, or he read something that bobcats meow and purr. And he was like, oh, cute little killing machine. I was like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He can keep his, his teeth and claws yeah, out of my camp. But uh, so any, anyway, yeah, I won't bother you. You don't bother me. But that was fun, though. Yeah, picking that up on yeah. audio. But most animals won't bother you, though, right? You're right. Yeah, there's a, there's a way to to avoid situations. Have you, have you ever come across a situation where you're like, oh, boy? Well, actually, there was <laughs> um, actually uh, on my my wife and I have these little tiny uh, dirt bikes, these little tiny motorcycles, and they're really quiet going downhill and they just kind of gliding, you know, about the only noise is the chain going. And uh, this was quite a number of years ago, but I come around this corner and right in the middle of the road, I slam on the brakes and come to a stop and this bear was literally like three feet out in front of the front tire. And that was when it was like, Oh, oh boy, what do I do? <laughs> and, yeah. and so there was that moment of, uh, you know, of, I look at him and he looks at me and he figures out what I was though. And then he went over the, the bank, but uh, so yeah, that's the closest I need to be to a bear. Um, yeah. <laughs> how do you, uh, how did you get started? Uh, your interest in the Sasquatch subject? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm here in Spokane, Washington. Um, I was a veterinarian for 35 years, uh, been retired the last couple of years. But uh, as a youngster, yeah, 10 years old, I saw Roger Patterson present the film here in Spokane in person. And I still remember my brain just saying, look at that animal, you know, look at it move. And I was hooked. Uh, from then on. So uh, a lifelong Bigfoot enthusiast. Um, I've been a BFRO investigator for five and a half years. But uh, but yeah, back in, you know, in junior high school and high school, we didn't have social media. So I just had to keep my ears open, uh, hear things through the grapevine, you know, like, uh, like somebody had a Sasquatch sighting, you know, where, <laughs> what time of day. And so also uh, then Shortly after Roger Patterson um, uh, had that film, was releasing the film, he uh, put out a newsletter. Um, he called them bulletins. And I signed up for those, uh, $6 a year, and uh, the, these quarterly bulletins. And it was his Northwest Research Association. And his logo looks, looks like this. And I kept those newsletters, then put them away, uh, had them all these years, put them away, a little bit of Bigfoot history there, and uh, the original, um, like I say, original newsletters, and the things that he wrote in there really were amazing. He really was forward thinking, but I thought, you know, now's the time that I need to donate them somewhere, get them out there somewhere so the public can see them. And so this summer I donated them to Cliff Berrickman and his North American Bigfoot Center in Boring, Oregon. So I feel feel good about that, that, that having some Bigfoot history out there too, being, you know, to be able to share that. Oh yeah, people will definitely want, that'll be a famous display for people to see. Because, uh, you know, he, he was actually, he was, uh, from what I could tell and from what uh, Gimlin has said, he was a pretty good researcher. He got cast. He got audio recordings from people. 
you know, eyewitness testimony and stuff. So he didn't jump around going, hey, I got Sasquatches everywhere, but he documented what he could document. Yeah, a lot of interviews. I think he interviewed, you know, yeah, tons of people. Um, and uh, yeah, his enthusiasm, of course, was was uh, was off the scale. Yeah. So but, you know, I don't know if, if you want me to mention a little bit about my approach too. Um, you know, I, I think they're curiously afraid, uh, meaning they're curious about what we're doing, but yet they're afraid of, of contact. And so um, I play on that curiosity I have for quite a number of years. I do things then that to try to increase my chances of an encounter. And not only at the mo at that moment, but then to to keep it going, to have them, you know, feel comfortable to come back the next night, you know, if they want to come into camp, um, you know, and so if uh, I need to be their entertainment, so be it. Um, I carry a harmonica uh, with me, um, light weight, you know, uh, durable. Um, and I'm not a musician, so <laughs> I can't really say that I play these things, but it's like, uh, I, okay, I make notes on them, I'll, I'll say. But then, uh, to a flute, uh, then a wooden flute, and uh, also what's uh, durable, uh, you know, inexpensive durable is an ocarina, and uh, ocarina, I guess is the correct pronunciation, ocarina, and that's referred to as a vessel flute. And so I can take those things out and, um, uh, like I say, you know, uh, try to get their curiosity, you know, like, what's that? You know, uh, what's that music playing at midnight out in the middle of the forest? And so I, but I also, I, a couple things to mention, uh, too, at the start here is that I, I do always question, you know, what else could it be? Uh, when I hear something, when something unfolds, uh, and then there's a saying that uh, my one friend and fellow BFRO investigator said, uh, and, and I, I'll give him credit for it, but I really like it, is that most all of the time, it's something else other than Bigfoot. But sometimes it cannot be anything else but Bigfoot. And those are the times that we that we want is that, you know, OK, that, you know, is Bigfoot activity and I want to keep it going. Uh, I've never had the, that feeling of dread. Um, like I say, I just am out there to um, enjoy things and to try to increase my chances of an encounter. I love the mystery. And so I just want to keep things going. Just want to keep going out there. Yeah. Have you ever tried like a um, decoys, like a decoy camp or anything like that? Yeah, we uh, we have. We've set up, you know, um, um, extra tents or, or a tent somewhere else um, to see if something would, you know, yeah, um, would would walk around it if we could find tracks around it or or whatever. Um, but I actually try to, like I say, make them feel comfortable of where I'm at. Well, I, I've heard plenty of stories about them messing with people at night while they're in their tents. Yeah, I, I don't know how much time we have here tonight, but um, but yeah, I've had my tent shaken multiple times, not just pushed on, you know, and it wasn't just a bare nose uh, then pushing on my tent. I mean, it was, it was like something had a hold of the uh, support bars and, uh, and, and rocking it back and forth. And you know, um, when I'm laying there and my face is just a few inches away from the wall of my tent and I hear these bipedal footsteps coming and you I literally hear a footstep. I can, you know, I can picture this, this foot landing just on the other side of my tent wall. And, you know, it's like I say, I've never had that feeling of dread, but, but, uh, of course my heart rate though, will go sky high <laughs> with something like that. Right. Cause yeah. Cause it's just, you know, it's, it's not a deer, you know, it, it's not a bear. I mean, you can, you hear it walking right in camp, you hear them stomping in camp and it's not deer, uh, stomping. Um, because we've, you know, well, last year 
too, uh, we had uh, the one uh, expedition, uh, there was stomping uh, around our camp, circled around our camp. Um, I heard some whistles. Um, another investigator heard some heard it stomping in front of her tent, you know, and uh, the next morning uh, we casted three, you know, possible tracks, uh, you know, they weren't, weren't real good, but uh, the depth of them in the ground was amazing. And uh, so, yeah, something, like I say, something stomped and something made <laughs> those tracks that were not there before. So, how, yeah. How did you, yeah. How did you become a? How did you become a uh, an investigator with the BFRO? Um, well, it's by invitation only, and so you need to get to know uh, the other investigators. You know, uh, go on expeditions with them, uh, public expeditions, uh, camp with them, get to know them. Uh, they get to know you then, and see what what you're like, and um, and then you know the recommendation gets put in to become an investigator. Oh, okay. That's neat. What, what, uh, before you, you, uh, how old were you when you seriously started going out in the woods? Was it right away when you were 10, you were aware and trying to listen for stuff? Like, when did you get into documenting stuff before the BFRO? Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, way before that years, you know, not only following it, um, you know, through hearing things through the grapevine. But of course, you know, my whole family is into camping. Um, you know, I was very fortunate that my dad took me out hunting. You know, I mean, he took me out when I could hardly keep up with him. Uh, you know, I was too young to too little to carry a rifle. But um, uh, getting out there and, and my dad didn't, you know, believe in it. You know, he was like, oh, I've hunted all my life. I've never, you know, seen anything heard and yeah never heard anything and and but i was always out there then after seeing roger patterson present the film i was out there keeping my ears open and and when i was camping uh, watching the ground you know for tracks and things like that but but yeah i mean i you know what's called the ohio howl i mean i heard that the, my first one that i heard was years years before they uh, nicknamed it or named it the Ohio Howl. So, yeah, there's, you know, it's been a lifelong uh, interest. So. Oh, people always ask this question. Do you have a hypothesis as to what the Sasquatch is? My, um, well, I, I don't know what exactly they they are you know that to, to point to that but i just like I say i love the mystery and 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 want to keep you know seeing what their behavior is out there what their responses might be um with the veterinary background that i have of course i'm i'm into the flesh and blood that's what i can can grasp uh, i'm you know fascinated with their anatomy what their anatomy might be because obviously we don't have a body but what what's i think of these things about you know what what's their anatomy like what are their taste buds like because they've been seen eating things that would be bitter to us and upset our stomachs so you know like i say i just think of those things you know uh, what what the anatomy is like uh, then from head to toe um and then um, those newsletters or, or like say bulletins that I mentioned from Roger Patterson, um, he, I'll quote this extract from one of the bulletins uh, of what he said. And I just, this really sums it up for me. This is what I really think then too, uh, or that I really agree with this is that he said, we believe these creatures to be extremely intelligent in the ways of the wild. If one is captured, it will probably be proven as the most intelligent animal next to man. Because of this intelligence, the association believes these creatures can completely elude man if they so desire. So that, you know, I mean, that, like I say, sums it up for me is that they're the intelligence and the ways of the wild and they can elude us whenever they want or, you know, let us get a glimpse of them or 
whenever they want. It's all on their terms is the way I feel. Uh, I feel like, you know, they, they want to have an escape route. They want to, to, you know, feel comfortable, feel safe. Um, they're intelligent. They know what our what a tent zipper sounds like and, and what that means. Um, you know, I mentioned that my tent was shaken uh, multiple times and uh, I was criticized on one Facebook group uh, about that. Well, why didn't you jump out with a flash camera and, you know, <laughs> get the, get the picture, you know, and it's like, okay, well, uh, first of all, they're smart. They know what the sound of the zippers are. I would have to, uh, you know, unzip my sleeping bag, unzip my tent door, jump out. You know, I'm, I'm not interested in doing that, trying to, you know, uh, jump around with a flash camera. Um, I'm not going to do that to them. I like to say, I want them to come back the next night. Um, if they want to come back and be in camp and, and walk through camp or whatever, if they want to slap my truck and leave a big old handprint uh, on the hood of my truck, that'd be great. I have never had that happen before. But, um, you know, uh, and then also I'm not going to jump out of my tent, too, that just in case I was mistaken, I'm not going to jump out and have a bear three feet in front of me uh, then, too. So, um, but yeah, they, 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 if they're watching and listening, they hear us go into our tents, you know, at night. And, you know, they know what that means and that we're inside there. And... Yeah, definitely. Well, they would, we hope. I hope they're, I hope they're like us. I hope they're close to us, you know? Yeah. That, like that, a... Yeah. Just I, I... the intelligence. Yeah. They, they, yeah. I mean, from the things that I've experienced uh, then too, um, you know, yeah the intelligence is there because i i know um a lot of people are well not a lot but there are other researchers uh, you know doug highcheck has teamed up with a guy to evolve dna collecting and stuff and they're they're getting samples and they're going to have them tested and stuff uh do you guys deal in dna um you know we've um we found hair samples last year um, and that did not have that medulla, you know, that, that center core, uh, and things like that. But, um, but the cost though, um, you know, that is, is the main thing is who's going to pay, uh, for the cost of having them, having it run. And I feel like the whole DNA thing is what really needs to happen is that somebody needs to be filming a Bigfoot and they need to, to see it, um, uh, you know, go over a barbed wire fence and, and leave some skin and hair or something like that, and then have that DNA tested. Uh, you know, we need, we need to almost show that, you know, or, or, or maybe a witness, a, a log logging truck driver, uh, you know, bumps one, uh, leave some skin and, and hair on the, on the, on the front of a truck. Uh, and, and then, then we know, okay, here was the source. Here's what the DNA results are. And, you know, that settles that. <laughs> yeah. You did a, uh, a podcast with uh, Stephen Major called The Flow of Evidence, which was interesting because you had the, uh, the flow of evidence chart there. Uh, could you go through that real quick? Do you remember it? Yeah, well, the, um, you know, of course, the, the, where there can be the most mistakes or the most misidentifications uh, is with witness reports, uh, with the reports, but yet there's thousands and thousands of them out there, and we can't all be wrong. Uh, the things that we've seen, that people have seen, and, and, uh, and what I saw last year, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, so, um, so yeah, like I say, though, that um, is somewhat weak, though, because there is a chance of misidentifications. And, and then there's uh, the next couple steps would be uh, tracks and audio. Um, the audio, uh, of course, you can turn it in and, and, and get the, you know, the, the audio footprints, the, you know, uh, of different animals. But um, uh, to me, the audio um, confirms 
what I and, and, and others camping with me. It confirms that we had activity around. Um, I mean, I've been reviewing my audio and, and, and somebody said they heard something at a certain time on a certain night and went back to re review my audio and trying to find that, see if I could pick up what they heard. And I hear wood knocks at that time. And nobody else was doing wood knocks or, you know, or, or nobody heard any wood knocks at that time. And so the, the audio, like I say, keeping track of times that you're hearing things uh, and reviewing the audio, uh, it, it just helps to confirm things, put things together. Uh, and then, of course, the tracks and, and the casts, uh, like you say, uh, or we were talking right before we went on, uh, you know, you, that you're really into the casts and everything. And yeah, that's, I think, you know, that's really getting high on the list. Uh, or the flow of evidence, uh, and then um, the um, and, and you know and, and as long as they're not the uh, uh, bare double step, you know, which is you know everybody mm -hmm. needs to everybody needs to yeah to to study and be aware, you know, and 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 look at that track and make sure that you know that and realize that there are bare double steps out there and uh, that they're not looking at, at something like that but yeah tracks are very important the casts and then of course the top of the list would be having a body uh, you know dna um, like i mentioned if we if we actually can know the source of the sample and then see the dna results of that sample uh, and then of course finding a body or a skeleton um, then where we can get try to get dna out of that and um, and, and look at a skeleton or or a skull or or something yeah the um the sighting you had do you want to go through that now sure um yeah, a lot of detail to it, uh, but yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, take your time. Go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, um, last May, uh, May of, of 2020, um, we were going up. We wanted to get up to this one spot that we knew where we were going, where we wanted to go. We were going uphill, and uh, on the Forest Service Road, uh, there was a couple elk uh, then that we saw, and there, and this was 2.30 in the afternoon, sunny day. Um, the you know, I, I just wonder about the elk. Uh, it could have been anything. They why they were out of their beds. Uh, they could have been going for a drink, or maybe did a was there a Bigfoot out wandering around and pushed them, bumped them out of their beds? Because uh, then what I saw a couple minutes later uh, that uh, maybe there was a Bigfoot you know, coming down this other road. So just up ahead or up above the elk, there was another road that turned. And we went on that, and this one was uh, the boughs of the trees were starting to grow across, to, you know, growing out into the road. And uh, we were going up there, and I came around the one corner, and um, up ahead uh, was this large boulder. Uh, I measured it later. It was three and a half feet tall, three and a half feet wide. And I, I'm getting closer and closer. I can't even tell you, you know, how fast I was going. I was just, a, but I was getting closer and closer to this boulder. I see some, well, and on the left side, um, my, my left side was a steep bank. And between the bank and this boulder, I see some black, but there's black chunks of, you know, decaying wood all over the forest. And so I didn't think much of it. And as I'm, as I'm approaching the boulder, uh, my focus goes to the narrowing of the road that goes around that boulder. And I'm watching, you know, like, okay, this is, <laughs> I got to get my, get my pickup truck right around here. You know, this is going to be, going to be tight. And, and I can't tell you how far away I was, but like I say, I was getting, approaching that narrow spot and this figure leaps out from behind the boulder it was airborne okay it landed on the other edge of the road and it uh then it landed probably in a crouched position and still leaning out over the embankment because but i couldn't see that because there was this bow 
sticking out and blocking my view, but I could see like this black butt uh, sticking there. And it paused and then went over the embankment. Um, what if you could picture, if I can put in your mind then, if you can picture that, uh, that you're a referee and you're watching the football game, you're watching the quarterback then, and a linebacker comes in to tackle the, or sack the quarterback. And so he was like lunging at the quarterback. Well, this is what, what it lunged across the road like that, but its arms weren't out. In fact, there, there, well, there were no ears, there was no nose, there were no front legs, like a bear or a moose. And what really <laughs> threw me, what I really had to process for a while, was because I saw something sticking up from its back, then its lower back. And your brain goes to, you know, what, what you're used to seeing. And I'm, and I, my brain think, you know, goes like, what there's a wingtip there st sticking up it's like what what did it have a holding a raven or what you know and i'm and i'm it took me a while to process but i realized its arms were back along its sides and a hand and fingers were sticking up and so you know like sticking up like like that um from its lower back and um all black um, you know, like a bear, but like I say, it wasn't, it wasn't a bear. And so if I, if I kind of have that, that picture in your mind, that figure uh, about the size of, like I say, about the size of a linebacker in football is what I would compare it to. Uh, so six, four, uh, or whatever. Um, it, of course it wasn't upright. So I, you know, didn't have any branches to see it walk under or how high those branches were. This leaped across the road. It landed there. So we get out and uh, my friend and fellow uh, investigator, uh, BFRO investigator, was behind me in his car with his wife. And he spotted then on the edge of the road, uh, he was a, uh, said, look, there's like two impressions here. There's like, it's like two feet landed here. And it was like, well, sure enough, it's it's flattened there, like two feet it landed. And then I looked over the bank and there were no, if it was a bear, there were no like four paws, you know, four legs going skidding down uh, the hillside. Uh, there was this one track uh, on the hillside and it skidded, it's, you know, as it slid. And then further down below that uh, was another skid mark, but it was as if it, whether it slid on, on both of its feet or, or maybe, it, maybe it went down and slid on its hip like I did because I went down there to uh, take pictures and, uh, of, the, of the track and I always, you know, lay out my rulers and, and take pictures. Um, uh, you should, as a tip, you know, you should take five pictures of every track to take advantage of the different uh, light angles. So take a picture from above and then looking from the back of it, looking from the front and one picture from each side. So I go down there to try to, you know, take my pictures at first and I slipped and slid on my hip downhill. And I just said to myself, okay, I'm not falling into this track. I'm going up on the, I'm forgetting the pictures. I'm going up on the road and mix up my casting material on the forest service road and bring it down. And so I started pouring and I start to see the, the, and the track had pushed, you know, dirt in front of it. And so dirt was, you know, starting to fall back into the toes and that. But um, anyway, I start pouring the cast material and I start to watch it, you know, run over and downhill. And there's that moment of panic, like this isn't going to turn out. Um, it's like, oh, no, um, there goes my casting material all downhill. But uh, I was say the consistency was was right. I, everything worked out okay. Um, I was able to get some of the, the skid mark, some of the slide mark, and then you can detect where the heel uh, was, a, a bit of a depth change. 
um, and toes. When we first went down there and, and looked at it, you know, the, it impressed me was that, wow, it's like, it's like there's toes then that are splayed, that there was like movement. And um, so uh, when I went down to donate the um, Roger Patterson newsletters to Cliff Berrickman, um, I said, you know, hey, I have this cast, I have this sighting and I have this cast, uh, if you could look at it. And uh, he, he said, oh, he said, this is a good cast. He says, this is a real thing. Uh, this is a, a Bigfoot track. And so I was just, you know, really pumped up, really excited to, uh, to, uh, to uh, have him say that. And uh, he contacted me last week and he's making a display for his Bigfoot Center. Uh, so, you know, here in a week or two, when he gets that finished, you'll be able to see um, a copy uh, of my cast <clears throat> because uh, he made uh, some copies of it. And there was, I don't know if this will show up. I can try this, but um, this is one of the copies that he made. And uh, the original, you know, still has dirt in it. And, but like each copy he made, or I don't know how you do it, how you make the diff how you make the copies, but, you know, they get, uh, some of them are really clean and white looking. So that's. Kevin, uh, before you go into that, uh, my uh, friend here had a question. Uh, what region, what time of year, and what time of day? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2.30 in the afternoon, um, sunny skies, and um, uh, uh, May uh, 2020, and it was the southeast, um, uh, southeast slopes of the uh, um, uh, Cascades, Washington Cascades. Um, we were back there um, 10 weeks later with an expedition, and one investigator, she had to leave early from the expedition. So the one morning she uh, had to take off and she was down on the low, got down on the lower road and she saw one, a black one, enter the trees. It didn't cross the road in front of her, but she saw it enter the trees and uh, she estimated the height at around six, seven, uh, no, six, ten. So, you know, if my height, uh, but like I say, mine, mine was not upright. I mean, it, cause it leaped, um, in front of me. So I'm just going by, like I say, it looked, it had the shape of a linebacker. Um, so if I was saying six, four, but she was, you know, she was maybe estimating six ten. um, you know, we're a few inches off, but then, you know, it was probably the same one. So we've got, so I like to, to, to review or, or, look at uh, like a report and is there more than one Bigfoot related um, incident in there? And so if there's like four in this, um, with this uh, ex encounter with this experience, then that I saw this figure, it was, you know, it wasn't a bear, it wasn't a moose. Um, then we saw impressions uh, like, on the edge of the road, like where feet landed, then a castable track, um, you know, that slid. Um, and, and it's not, like I say, it's not perfect, but you can see that there was even movement to the big toe. Uh, there's part of the big toe that where there's a, a deeper uh, impression um, than on to the outside of it. So it's like the toe moved as it pushed off as it skidded and pushed off. Um, and then, and then 10 weeks later, uh, another, uh, sighting of probably the same, same one by a super incredible, a super credible person. So, you know, four things, you know, tying it all together. Yeah. Did you want to try and show that cast? Yeah. I, people I, want to see it anyway, probably. Yeah. And I don't know if you have some pictures that I sent you, but um, so this is not the original. This is a copy. And so down here is the slide area. And then you can see where a heel starts right in, right in here, in here area. And then, then the toes up here. And so this big toe I'll turn it this way 
to see, or maybe you can kind of even see it this way, that there's some depth, more depth here than out here. I don't know if that, I don't know if that shows, kind of shows, it's hard to, hard to tell, but this is where it pushed up dirt in front of it, you know, so the cast came out of the ground like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With, like I say, with dirt here. And so this is my material um, running downhill and uh, running over the cast and then and, and running downhill like that. Uh, did you, uh, did you, did you ever, were you able to uh, judge the distance you were at when you saw it? Not really, because like I say, I was moving, um, you know, I was driving and I, I don't even know how fast I was driving, but, um, you know, I had to have been slowing down because my focus was on that narrow part of the road to go around the boulder and it, it, it seemed pretty close. It seemed pretty big in front of me. Um, but yeah, I, I just, you know, I can't tell you, you know, exactly, you know, how far away it was. Yeah. If people go to the, uh, the, the Stephen major interview in the description, he shows a couple other casts. I think you got a copy of a, of one of the Patty cast. Uh huh. That so, was pretty cool. So my my cast, you know, of course, came out really big because I got some of the skid mark. I tried to get some of the skid uh, and then catch the heel. Um, and then, of course, I've got cast material that's that's running downhill, that's running over uh, the toes. So the foot of mine was really not all all that long it's shorter than than patties but uh, yeah here's here's patties this kind of, i should get my original out because this copy is heavy can't heavy, believe yeah this <laughs> copies are always heavier oh yeah the copy's incredibly heavy but anyway um but yeah um Yeah. So yeah, mine looks mine looks gigantic, but like I say, it's um <laughs> it's I was yeah. It was trying the to, run off. Trying to yeah, trying to cast uphill and then there was runoff downhill. And so have you done investigations with Stephen Major? Um, you know, we, I have not, I have not been out. Um, but yeah, his enthusiasm is, uh, is off the charts, uh, for Bigfoot. Um, you know, put him down to see if you can get him as a future guest then too. Um, so, but yeah, um, he's great and his enthusiasm, uh, yeah, is incredible. And so, um, but we've, we've not been, we've not been out in the field actually camping or, or anything yet. So. Um, if you want, you could just look up flow of evidence, Kevin Llewellyn, and it'll come up. It was called uh, Bigfoot today. Uh, yep. The show. Yeah. Bigfoot today. Today. Flow of evidence. Look for that particularly because he put that in, in, in part of the title of the video. Or you go to Bigfoot today and you'll find it. <laughs> On yeah. Bigfoot today, it's flow of evidence, I believe. Yeah, episode two, I believe. Yeah, on Bigfoot today, so you should be able to find that. Yeah, search for that. Yeah, was that your first sighting? Yes. First, oh, and, we, first did, and only. Did we mention that Meldrum's going to get a copy of that cast? Uh, I might not have mentioned yeah, but uh, Cliff is going to to send uh, a copy that he made um, then to Dr. Meldrum too. So, oh, that'll be cool. Yeah. So that yeah, like like I say, I'm yeah, um, you know, really excited. Um, then that just uh, the way the, the just to have the cast turn out, 
um, and not break on me and um, and just to get it to show you know what it does and yeah you know cliff says hey you know the the ones that aren't just perfect uh, they're the most exciting to study and to look at and and to see what what happened what's going on uh, with the anatomy and, and the movement of the foot right well, I've heard that there's two people to really show your cast to is Barackman and Meldrum. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, I, I like I say, uh, he's working on a cliff is working on a, on a display uh, then. And, uh, and uh, you'll be able to see a, a, a copy of the cast there. And, and uh, of course, yeah, he's the collections that those two have cliff and, and Dr. Meldrum, a collection of casts uh, between the two of them. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, out of out of the reports that you've taken with the BRFRO, is there is there a few that stand out to you where you went, wow, I got to go there myself? Oh, I yeah. Um, with the BFRO reports, yeah, I've I've had over sixty that have been released to the public, um, and. And yeah, I follow up uh, on ones that I can. Um, I do watch, though, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho um, for reports, uh, you know, and, and to interview witnesses. But um, uh, but but I will try to go to those places, follow up, um, you know, when I can uh, get to those places where the reports uh, are at. Um, yeah, there's there's just there's so many uh, that that the I mean, I've interviewed, you know, retired wildlife biologists, you know, veterans, um, you know, uh, law enforcement people, um, you know, hunters. And the one that one that sticks out uh, was in the the it was a long time ago. And it was a recall that she was doing. Um, it was in the North Cascades of Washington State. And she I could try to figure out could have figured out her age probably but but she sounded you know like an elderly lady and she uh, uh, had a sighting with her mom when she was a teenager uh, they were on horseback and her mom of course told her you know don't you ever ever say anything about this to anybody and don't don't you tell anybody but she uh, turned in the report and uh, I interviewed her. And at the end, you know, I thanked her for turning in the report. <clears throat> and and she, you know, said, oh, I hope this helps, you know, to have that in the database. And that was just so neat. You know, mm -hmm. I just remember, yeah, it just, you know, like I say, it was elderly lady. And it was like, you know, coming forward with what she saw as a teenager. And, um, yeah, it was like. She wanted that to, to get into the database uh, after all those years. Do you have um, do you have some advice for people who are just getting into researching? Uh, that good, great question. Um, I would just I would say first off, uh, go you know go with the attitude that you're that you're just a visitor to the forest that you mean no harm, uh, that you're going to enjoy yourself. Um, and like I say, you know, ask yourself, you know, um, what else could it be, you know, when you hear something, uh, when something happens. Um, for example, the time that I had rocks thrown at my tent, it was a, it was a bit different because I was camped on a gravel area, and so I had the blue vinyl tarp, you know, under the tent uh, as the footprint under the tent, and uh, the tent I had at that time was four and a half feet tall, and so I had to get down on my knees, you know, to unzip the door, um, and so I left about 14, 16 inches of the tarp out in front of the door so I could kneel on that and crawl into the tent. Uh, right at dawn one morning, you know, I awakened, I hear this, you know, tick and I'm thinking, oh, 
great. There's a squirrel there. You know, there was a tree behind my tent. And then, so I think there's a squirrel up on the tree up above me and it's dropping things out of the, out of the tree. Um, and then all of a sudden there was another sound, another tick. And, and then I realized it was like, something's hitting that the tarp. And there was like a dozen little rocks uh, then that were thrown and every one of them hit the, that edge, that strip of tarp. Not one bounced off the tent. And it dawned on me later, it took me a while, but it dawned on me later that the accuracy, um, you know, if I would have tried to do that, I don't know what distance the rocks were coming from, uh, the, just the little pebbles like that, little rocks. Um, but I don't know what distance they were coming from, but if I would was going to try to do that. I mean, I would have been bouncing a few of them off the tent, off the door of the tent. And so the accuracy uh, was what dawned on me later. It's amazing. If they wanted to hurt us, they could. You know, if they wanted to hit us with a rock, I, they certainly could. But, and, and so like I say, um, you know, um, you know, something, if you start to, if you're out there and you're starting to have an encounter, uh, experience something for the first time, uh, you know, just take a deep breath and just, you know, like I say, keep the attitude. Um, I mean, you no harm and do what I just let them do what they're going to do. Like I say, if they want to come into camp, you know, I let them come into camp. Um, so, uh, I just let things unfold. I don't try to, you know, like I mentioned, you know, jump out with a flash camera or anything like that. Um, you know, be safe out there. Uh, there's a lot of other animals out there uh, uh, that have higher populations than Bigfoot. And, you know, so, you know, be aware that, uh, yeah, you might, you know, it does it sound like a Bigfoot. Or you, maybe it's a Bigfoot. But just let things unfold uh, because it might be something else um, then too. So, you said something else before with the audio that uh, and uh, skeptics. And uh, for a lot of us, we go through audio and we go, "Okay, that's an own animal." But when you get something really odd, you know, a person like me is going to say, "Yeah, but all the animal sounds aren't recorded." But when you said it's pr it shows that we do have activity, do you register that as possibly activity? Well, yeah, everything is, I mean, because, of course, you know, you know, you're not seeing what's making those wood knocks. So, um, you know, because, yeah, um, trees creak, trees pop, you know, and everything like that, too. But, but you know, but if somebody here's wood knocks at, at a certain time and I um, go into the audio and, and confirm, okay, yeah, there were wood knocks here. And then, then wait a minute, the, the audio picked up something over here uh, that nobody heard, you know, that, that those sounded like rock clacks or, or something or other kind of wood knocks, wood tapping, uh, something that nobody else heard. Um, that actually happened this summer on, on one expedition. They, some people heard, um, did they hear three sets? They heard um, um, some over here and then like something answering it, Knox answering it. And they heard three sets, which would have been six. But when I went to my audio, I picked, a, I counted 11 that, th that I could pick up on the audio. And so they heard six, but I heard even more. So were there lighter ones? Was there another, was there something else in the distance, you know, that they didn't hear the other ones? So when I say the audio, you know, confirms that, that we had things going on, uh, activity, uh, I guess that would be, be a good example of, of that. My that buddy Brent. Yeah. That's where the audio, that's where the audio helps. Yeah. My buddy Brent does, uh, is in Washington state. He, he explores the cascades too. And, uh, his, it's so deep and dense that 
they could travel quarters between Canada and the U.S. is one question. They could oh. use all this area. Like your travel, your Sasquatch theory on, on traveling. Yeah. Well, I have the here in Spokane. Um, I don't know if Sean, if you're familiar with the, um, the missionary uh, Walker that was with the uh, Spokane tribe, then the Native Americans here, and he wrote a letter. And um, I, I back to his, I don't know, to his, um, you know, other parishioners or, or other missionaries. But anyway, he wrote this letter about things that the Spokane tribe <clears throat> was saying that, you know, how they would come in the night and steal their salmon and things like that. And then he said, um, they, the, the Spokane tribe, believe that they, the Bigfoot, come from the big mountain. Well, what's the big mountain? Mount Rainier? So was there a travel route from Mount Rainier to Eastern Washington and Northern Idaho? Um, you know, so yeah, the, um, and, and I, yeah, I loved last week's, last Wednesday's show that, uh, too, that you guys, uh, you had the panel, uh, the round table discussion or, or the panel of people, Sean. And, and so, yeah, I really like that. Um, the, you know, it came up with population, one question, and two, and and I think, you know, that they have to travel, the, the young males need to take off and, and go searching to start a family unit uh, to, you know, cut down on inbreeding and, and things like that. And let me, pardon me as I block out the camera here, but I'll share this with you, just with you real quick, that um, I found this uh, a few years ago. This was March of 2017. It was the American Scientist. And what they did is this, they did their, they ran their algorithms and whatever they, the scientists do. <laughs> and they were looking for, um, you know, what would be a, a minimum population size that would continue um through time uh through through being evolutionary uh population and a long-term uh success is the way they worded it and the problem the one critique with this paper that they did was that um they applied it to all animals so they uh, had amphibians uh you know and mammals uh and they even had uh plants in here too um like rare plants but anyway, they ran their algorithms and all that, and they came up with the number that uh, of 5,000. And they said that 500 um, would probably result mm -hmm. in inbreeding. And that so that, that 500 just, you know, wouldn't work. And that they said that 5,000 is the, the most likely number for uh, uh, some species to hit the sweet spot then maybe more, maybe less. But that would be for, like I say, continuing long-term survival. So, um, and, but when it comes to, of course, population, it's like pick a number. I mean, we don't know. Um, you know, it's just, just a guess. Uh, but I thought I'd share that with you too, that, uh, that I'd come across that a few years ago where they, they tried to, to figure out some population size like that. Yeah, I've read a few things and it was a, you know, it, it's more like a, uh, a good guess. Oh yeah. We don't, yeah. we like to have fun with it sometimes, you know, yeah, well, we like yeah. to have some fun, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like what, can... what, what do they do with their dead? You know, questions like that. It, it, it's it's a fun question, you know. Mm -hmm. In more acidic, wet areas, those bones eventually are just going to break down. Oh yeah, they, yeah, you know, and, and and or if one goes off, if one is feeling sickly, um, if I was a Bigfoot and I was feel, feeling real sick, um, I would head down into the biggest canyon, the deepest canyon that I could, and you know, lay down by some nice little stream and 
you know, <laughs> and pass away, you know, and, and then like that. And, you know, and yeah, a human's not going to get down there and, 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 and find you, find a body like that. So, so yeah, what, who knows, you know, yeah. Do they, do they bury their dead? Do they, they crawl in somewhere in, in amongst some rocks or something or, and, and pass away. Um, so, but yeah, uh, I always like to say the, the odds of us finding one, it's, it's as bad as finding a needle in 10,000 haystacks, 50,000 haystacks, um, whatever, you know, it's the, yeah, the odds are, are, yeah, not good. Things just break down, you know, they're not going to fossilize. Nature's going to, you know, to break down that body and Along the way, while you were researching, did you ever go, geez, I'm not too sure if these things are actually real? Well, it get, um, uh, I've been fortunate, you know, with the things that the class B type things that I've had, you know, class, class A being a sighting where, you know, it couldn't be anything else, you know, but a Bigfoot. Uh, then and, and and that would be a class A, so I feel you know I've been fortunate with the with all the class B type activity that I've had over the years, but but yeah it you know you, you do get frustrated and 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 you because most of the time nothing happens, so you just have to just enjoy yourself out there and and wait for those times when something does start to happen, um, and. But yeah, and, and I know other investigators have said too, you know, it's like, oh, I, you know, let's find a body, you know, but, but then my answer to them too is like, well, keep looking for that needle in 10,000 haystacks. And <laughs> so, what is it like to lead an expedition? Oh, you know, the, and it's, it's great because, well, it's, it's, you know, it's work, uh, you know, we've got there's organization and everything, you know, they're involved, but, um, you know, the biggest part, uh, somebody might be thinking, you know, that I'm going to say talking about Bigfoot and, or whatever, but, but actually the, the best part to me is making new friends. Um, I have people that I'm in contact with, you know, that I was on, you know, that I met on expeditions, you know, many years ago. So, um, it's, it's, you know, staying in contact with people like that, making friends and, you know, and, and, and they're in contact, like, you know, well, well, I'm going to head to this area, uh, whatever. I'm going to head to this part of the Washington Cascades this weekend. Um, let you know if something happens, you know, it's like good luck, but then, you know, most of the time nothing happens. So, um, but it's just, you know, yeah, like I say, staying in touch with people and making new friends. And, uh, and, and then of course there is, you know, you know, introducing people to being out there in the dark. Um, you know, a lot of people have just not, you know, they go in their tents, um, a little while after darkness and, and they don't go out, um, into the woods. And so it's, you know, introducing it to them, uh, trying to give them tips and pointers and, and being with them and, you know, uh, ensuring, uh, uh, assuring them that it's okay. Um, you know, um, if, if you feel frightened, it's okay. You know, let's head back to camp, that type of a thing. But, but it's like, you know, they're not going to hurt you. Um, you know, there's BFRO investigators that have experience. Um, you know, they're just, you know, there's, there's no experts out there, but right. there's just, yeah, but there's just, there's people that have more experience than others. When interviewing, how do you determine if the person has a misidentification? What kinds of questions do you ask? Um, yeah, what, um, I, I hate to not answer <laughs> your question there with Jace, was it JC? But, uh, um, I don't want to give away my any tricks or any tips of what I might do when I'm talking to somebody, what I'm, you know, um, cause yeah, I don't want them just, you know, giving me a story or, or, or trying to do some kind of a hoax or something like that. So, 
so I have, yeah, my little things that I do. Um, I guess I would say that if I was going to interview you, be prepared for the unexpected, that you don't know maybe what I'm going to ask. Um, there was one report one time where the, the guys were, were watching these figures. They were watching them with their flashlights at this certain distance. And, and, and they were seeing, seeing these things. There was even uh, like a young one, a juvenile that was trying to hide behind a stump or something. And, and they could see, you know, like this head, the silhouette of a head pop up and that. But, um, and then there were a couple stand up figures um, at the tree line. Um, and so all of a sudden I just hit him with the question, uh, well, what were the lumens of your flashlights? And they, they, they knew, right. You know, they answered right away. And so then I could look up, okay, what's the manufacturer? What are some flashlights that have this certain power, these certain lumens and what's the manufacturer's, uh, recommended distance, um, of that flashlight. And so, like I say, all I can, I don't want to really give any more examples or give out much more, except just to say, um, um, you know, you don't know what I'm, what I'm going to hit you with. <laughs> so <laughs> catch them. You say sometimes you, some, you catch somebody off guard, they start stumbling and bumbling. It, well, that, yeah, that's, that's what it boils down to. But like I say, I'm just going to, going to hold my, hold my little, little tricks or my little things uh, that I do. And, but, but yeah, it's just, um, you know, getting the details. Uh, I, I like, I want to get the details. Uh, I think that's what the reader of a report uh, wants is to see the details and, um, you know, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I may say something like, you know, like, uh, well, actually where the, the location where this report happened, I was camping there six months earlier or, you know, whatever. I may add something like that to a report, but, you know, uh, otherwise it's, it's getting the details from the witness and, and going over it uh, with them. Cool. Yeah, some people don't like that question because you're like, well, I have my own thing I do. And I'm like, that's fine. But people like to know. Yeah, well, I, they, yeah, they like, like I say, they like to know. But um, but uh, I try, especially when there's a when there's a report or when I, I, I heard what somebody has experienced or what they're saying uh, or what they've said. And I read that and I prepare myself and I'm like I say, yeah, you just don't know what what I might come up with <laughs> to, to ask. So, well, I imagine because there's so much that goes into the BFRO that there's probably some investigators who may not be as as thorough as you are. Is there like a, a set standard for investigators to follow? There is, yeah. And so, um, again, it's not getting all the details, but, but it's, it's getting the location, you know, you've, you've got to tell me where you were at and, and yeah, I'll, I'll go look at the, at the maps and you're saying that, uh, that, yeah, there was there, you're there, there was these switchbacks and this Bigfoot ran across the road in front of me and on these switchbacks at such and such a location. And so I'll go look at the, look at the maps and it's like, um, Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. I see where, where you were at. And so, yeah. So there's, yeah, there's things like that. Yeah. Where we're, we're checking on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, because there's a lot of people out there that, that really feel that all this is made up and we're all just, well, me, I'm a viewer, so I'm just, I'm using my imagination to have some fun. What What is the seriousness of not just, wait, no, what is the seriousness of just treating this as a, as a joke? Is there, a, do you think there's consequences besides people being ridiculed? Do you, well, do you mean um, like, like, like 
uh, hoaxing or something then to keep yeah it or just yeah well well um uh, yeah you know if <laughs> oh yeah yeah um you're raising my blood pressure when you start talking about about hoaxers um but and then the guy the if you heard too uh what year was it that uh, the guy got hit in montana dressed in a ghillie suit trying to run across the highway you know um trying to whatever hoax then drivers that they were seeing uh, a bigfoot cross the highway but he got hit and killed so you know um yeah don't you know yeah don't be trying to uh, to to hoax people um um you know no, no tricks um like that um i'm not you know yeah if you're going to be camping with me uh, you know and you're going to try to pull some tricks you know then then i'm not gonna, out. yeah yeah i'm not going to have anything to do with you yeah because yeah. to me it just enables more more people to ridicule who, people who could be honest you know I, I i think that's the one of the more shameful aspects of, of, of what hoaxing en enables yeah it just you know the people that are out there that 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 really experience something and uh or they they really find some possible tracks you know tracks that look good and, and things like that and um and yeah and the hoaxing just just interferes with that um yeah so like you say um i it's just i just say yeah no don't do it you're raising my blood pressure and um <laughs> so is there any other interesting um um experience you've had that you want to share well um i'm the yeah i don't know how much time we have oh, but, go ahead you can go for well, it yeah well there was this time where the intelligence of them and uh, to show how they can plan things out um there was uh, one time where i was out with um, a, a husband and a wife and we'd been scouting that afternoon and we found this came to this little spot this little ledge this little bench and uh, there was a little stream below us in the hillside um, that we were looking north. There was this hillside in front of us. And to our west, to our left, was this uh, big basin. And we all kind of had this feeling like, wow, if I was going to hide, you know, if, if a Bigfoot was going to hide, you know, back in there, that basin, that really looks good. And we decided to just go out uh, before it got dark go out and get ourselves in position on this this little bench and listen to that hillside and let it get dark and uh right after dark then here comes this deer and we couldn't see anything um and this was years ago before i had a thermal um we hear this deer coming from the direction of the basin and it's blowing and snorting and we were able to follow it by that sound uh, and the, all the snorting and blowing got up to this little half acre spot on the hillside and it just was going up and down back and forth and it just stayed there and i you know like i say i mean my my dad took me out hunting when i was just you know yeah you know, knee high to whatever um and so i've never heard a deer you know behave like that and so the guy that was with me, he said, Kevin, do a howl. And, and so he says, I can't do a very good howl. He says, Kevin, do a howl. And so I turned my head towards that basin and started in with a howl. And I kept it going as I turned my head then to the hillside in front of us. And before I was done or, or right as I was done, he, he said, did you hear that below us? He says, it sounded like a bulldozer took out. And I said, my head's still ringing from doing the howl. I didn't hear hear that. And and then all of a sudden we hear this gibberish over to our left from the, the area where the deer, where we first heard the deer coming from. And it sounded as if it was high pitched. It sounded as if a young lady was out there talking really fast and that you couldn't understand what she was saying. Um, 
like I say, it just, just came across as, as gibberish. And we heard that a couple times. The deer started to take off then and go over to the northeast uh, over the, the ridge. And just whatever, a few seconds later, a minute later, it's coming back and it's blowing and snorting. And at, by that, that time, I think my jaw was on my chest. You know, I couldn't believe then what the deer was doing. So it's like something pushed it, turned it around and pushed it back. So it got back onto the hillside, back into that spot, continued to blow and snort. Um, like I say, we heard that gibberish over to our left on the hillside. And then we heard it in front of us. We heard it a third time directly across from us. And at that time, the deer took off over the, the ridge line, over the north. And then there were wood knocks directly in front of us. And at that point, the guy that was with me, the people that were with me, they, you know, they said, um, okay, uh, maybe it's time to go. <laughs> and yeah. so as, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you can have more than one thing that's Bigfoot related, so someone might say, well, that gibberish you heard, that was a fox or something like that. And um, it's like, no, um, you know, I know what I heard. And then there were wood knocks. So you've got, like I say, uh, gibberish chatter and wood knocks together. The behavior of the deer was like it was surrounded. It's like they had a deer drive going on. It's like there were one or two pushing the deer into a couple others. And one that was below us and close to us may have taken out uh, when I did that howl, because like I say, the guy said, you know, that sounded like a bulldozer going through the brush. Something just took out below us. And then if there was another one up there that turned that deer around, because that was just, I mean, you know, deer take off and they're gone, but something turned the deer around and it's back and snorting and blowing. And so just the, the whole, the way things unfolded and the behavior of the deer and, and the things that we heard then, um, that was amazing. Um, you know, I, I feel like that was almost as rare as a sighting then to have something like that going on, that if that was a, a Bigfoot hunt going on, uh, if they were hunting this deer and they were like you say, they were doing it by by a deer drive. I, you know, that's just to me, it was amazing. We've been and talking I, about, and so I say, and so then I started saving my pennies, and I bought a thermal <laughs> not long after that. So I was like, I have to, I have to see into the nighttime. I have to have a thermal imager. Have you caught anything interesting on the thermal imager, even if it um, wasn't Sasquatch? No. Well, um, no, no, other than just other than bear and, you know, things like that. Um, but that even just for safety to have have something, you know, even if you, you know, don't don't get a real expensive one, even if you can have one, you know, that that you can see in the dark and see around you. Um, and and so because, yeah, like I mentioned, there's a lot more animals out there, cougar and and bobcat and and you want to be able to see into the darkness just for safety, just to see other animals. Kevin, what would you say to skeptics to get them con to consider the existence of Bigfoot? Uh, keep coming out yeah. with me. <laughs> um, uh, I hope my, I, 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 like I say, I just, I feel fortunate. Uh, but, but then I've been in this, you know, a, a lifetime, so to speak, um, you know, uh, since 10 years old. Um, and you just have to keep going out there and starting, start to experience things yourself, um, you know, and just, you know, let, you know, when you hear something and, and, and I mean, I've, I've had people say this too, that, that when they, they hear some things, and, and that they finally experience some things 
then it's like, okay, yeah, there, there is something to this, that, that, you know, that wasn't whatever, you know, uh, some You're other, welcome. yeah, it wasn't some other animal out there. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, you, you, you heard whoops, but it, it wasn't a raven, you know, it was, it was, it was whoops. Uh, or, or, and, or was it an owl at night? You know, was it a raven during the day? Was it an owl at night? Um, you know, rule those things out and uh, just keep getting out there and, and trying to have all the experiences that you can. Do you take skeptics out? Um, well, I mean, people, I mean, that's with the BFRO expeditions. I mean, that's to introduce people um, to you know, be oh, out okay. there. To, yeah. What to do, you know? So, um, so yeah, there's, I mean, yeah, we had, we, you know, we had this summer, well, we had, well, my co-leader, I don't know what, what the one people had said to him, to my co-leader, um, uh, at the start of the expedition, if they said like, you know, like, nah, you know, we don't know. Um, but then when they were leaving saying their goodbyes, at the end of the expedition, my co-leader said, said, well, are you off the fence or whatever? And they said, yeah, well, we're like 70, 30 now. So, um, you know, yeah, it's, um, yeah. What type of, uh, do you know what type of thermal you use? Um, well, I have, yeah, I have the uh, FLIR uh, TS32 uh, Pro. And um, so uh, I don't know if they even make that anymore. I've had it for a number of years, but, um, and, and yeah, they're getting better and better, um, you know, as far as the pixelation and, and the clarity. And so, uh, yeah, I'd like to get even get a newer one. But um, but right now, yeah, I'm still still using uh, that one. So it's got more distance than the Scout. Um, you know, yeah, it's you're supposed to be able to the, this TS. TS32 Pro is supposed to, you're supposed to be able to see a, a man-sized image at 400 yards. And at the time I could have got uh, a magnifying lens for it, but I, I didn't spend the money uh, on that. That would, ex would have extended the range um, then. So, but, uh, but yeah, I've watched, you know, deer that are, that are out there and, and bear and, and that, that are out there, you know, 300 yards away and, and, um, you can tell what they are and I can watch them. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, um, have you ever, um, ah, oh, man, I lost my question. Oh, are there local conferences like the one at Medellin Falls where we can find Kevin? Yeah. If Kevin goes to conferences, do you have anything planned? Um, not right now. Um, you know, but, uh, but yeah, there will probably be Medellin Falls, uh, in Northeast Washington, uh, had, uh, its first, uh, conference, uh, this year. And it sounds like it's going to be an annual thing. Uh, so there'll probably be number two, uh, then next year. And so, but, um, but yeah, it, um, I would rather be in the woods <laughs> um, than at a conference, but um, so, but I, I do try to make it to, to, to some conferences, but. Um, it's hard to turn down when they ask you to speak though. Well, Isn't yeah. If, if, if it's a speaker type thing, then yeah, it's, you know, so, but, uh, but like I say, I love the mystery. Uh, I just, I want to keep, I want to continue to, to, have encounters increase my keep increasing my chances to have an encounter uh and um uh, and yeah i'd just rather be in the woods kevin thanks for joining me tonight i appreciate it and uh keep oh. us updated on if meldrum uh what meldrum says about the the cast that yeah be interesting I will. Yeah. It sounds like Cliff has a lot of casts. He mentioned that he has quite a few casts to send to Dr. <laughs> Meldrum. And so Dr. Meldrum's, yeah, probably, yeah, probably. Uh, over It'll take a while, but he, yeah. he, he, but yeah. he gets well, to it. Just, Especially I'll, I'll if leave. Barackman's telling him, you know, <laughs> hey, you got to look at this one. Yeah. But I'll leave, I'll leave you with this thought real quick. Um, if you see something out there that you think that, you know, it's something upright, if you see something, then um, don't take a picture. And I, I know you're going, what? Don't take a picture. 
you know, press the record button, get a video. We need to see movement. We want to see arms swing, you know, legs moving. We, we want to see, you know, no more blob squatches. <laughs> so, and go. I'll leave you with that. There you go, guys. Thanks for joining us, guys. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Sean.